Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, as you know, my name is Ruman James, and um, I will be presenting tonight. The topic of discussion is uh, celebrating Juneteenth, lessons from the Lotus Sutra, uh, insights from Chapter 20, the Bodhisattva Never Disparaging. So good evening, everyone. I want to start off by basically Okay, there we go. Start off by going over um, the the uh, flow of the discussion. So first, I wanted to discuss Juneteenth itself and provide a brief um, historical background on how we got started and how it led up to what it is today. I uh, wanted to also then discuss the legacy of slavery and uh, how the impact of slavery on African-Americans was profound and multifaceted and uh, encompassed uh, various areas such as physical, emotional, and societal dimensions. Uh, and then we wanna talk about chapter 20 of the Lotus Sutra and the Bodhisattva Never Disparaging, uh, connecting Juneteenth to chapter 20, and then how chapter 20 provides insights into liberation and dignity. So understanding Juneteenth. Uh, Juneteenth celebrates the end of slavery in, in the United States. It's also known as Emancipation Day, Juneteenth Independence Day, and Black Independence Day. On June 19th, 1865, Major General Gordon Granger arrived in Galveston, Texas, and announced the end of the Civil War and the end of slavery. Although the Emancipation Proclamation came two and a half years earlier on January 1st, 1863, and many slave owners continued to hold their slaves captive after the announcement. Uh, Juneteenth became a symbolic date representing African-American freedom. The 1865 date is largely symbolic. The Emancipation Proclamation issued by President Abraham Lincoln that legally freed slaves, as I said, in 1863. Um, and like I said, it was, it was um, something that not everyone was in agreement with. Uh, Texans celebrated Juneteenth beginning in 1866 with community-centric events such as parades, cookouts, prayer gatherings, historical and cultural readings, and musical performances. Over time, communities had developed their own traditions. Some communities purchased land for Juneteenth celebrations, such as Emancipation Park in Houston, Texas, as families immigrated from Texas to other parts of the United States, they carried the Juneteenth celebrations with them. On January 1st, 1980, Juneteenth officially became a Texas state holiday. Uh, Al Edwards, a freshman state representative, put forth the bill making Texas the first state to grant this emancipation celebration. Since then, 45 other states and the District of Columbia have also declared it an official holiday. In terms of spread and observance, as African Americans migrated from Texas to other parts of the country, they carried the tradition of Juneteenth with them, spreading its observance with other states. Despite the joyous celebrations, Juneteenth was not officially recognized as a public holiday, and its observance was often localized with African American communities. Now, there was a decline during segregation. So, during the early 20th century, the celebration of Juneteenth declined as African-Americans face segregation, economic hardship, and racial violence. Many communities struggled to maintain their tradition amid these challenges. Moving to the civil rights movement, the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 1960s brought renewed interest in African-American history and heritage, including Juneteenth. Activists and the community leaders began to revive Juneteenth celebrations as a symbol of freedom and resistance. As I mentioned previously, in 1980, Texas became the first state to officially recognize Juneteenth as a state holiday. Uh, following Texas lead, many other gradually recognized June, Juneteenth. Uh, in terms of a uh, national movement, in recent decades, Juneteenth has gained national prominence with celebrations held across the United States, including parades, cultural festivals, educational events, and more. The Black Lives Matter movement and other contemporary social justice efforts have further highlighted the importance of Juneteenth as a day of reflection and action. Leaning towards the federal holiday, 
On June 17, 2021, President Joe Biden signed the Juneteenth National Independence Day Act into law, officially making it a federal holiday. Uh, the federal recognition of Juneteenth underscores its significance as a national commemoration of the end of slavery and celebration of African-American culture and resistance. Now, from here, I wanted to discuss the legacy of slavery. And as I mentioned before, too, the impact of slavery on African-Americans was profound and multifaceted. Right? Uh, really uh, hitting other areas that um, we may not have thought had a significant um, or that would be a significant problem, put it that way. Uh, the legacy of these impacts continue to shape African Americans' life and the broader American society today. So, in discussing the physical, emotional, and social societal impact of slavery on African Americans, um, I thought it was important to note uh, Edward E. Baptist's uh, book, The Half Has Never Been Told Slavery and the Making of American Capitalism. Uh, in his book, he provides a historical analysis that argues that slavery was not just a Southern institution but was deeply intertwined with the economic development of the United States. Uh, it discusses that the brutal exploitation of enslaved African-Americans was central to the rise of American capitalism. Uh, when I first looked at the book and started looking at the, the, the chapters, the chapters of the book are divided into body parts with the head or the heart first, head, hand, right hand, left hand, tongues, breath, seed, blood, back, and arms. Baptiste writes, one day I found a metaphor that helped. It came from the great African-American author, Ralph Ellison. You might know him from his novel, Invisible Man. But in the 1950s, Ellison also produced incredible essays. And one of them he wrote, on the moral level, I propose we view the whole of American life as a drama enacted on the body of a Negro giant who, Lion trussed up like Gulliver forms the stage and the scene upon which and within which the action unfolds. Baptiste also writes, this trussed up giant stretched out on the rack of America's torture zone actually grew like a person passing through ordeals to new maturity. I have divided the chapters of this book with Ellison's imagined giant in mind, a structure that has allowed the story to take at its center point the experience of enslaved African Americans themselves. And although I'm still reading through the book, it's, it's, it's a lengthy book and um, having a, a year and a half year old, um, somewhat difficult to maintain concentration. A um, couple of main themes did come to mind. One was the personal narratives. Uh, throughout the book, uh, Baptiste interweaves the personal stories of enslaved people, bringing a human dimension to the historical and economic analysis. These narratives highlight the resilience and suffering of those who endured slavery. Uh, one of the stories uh, in there is about a woman named Patsy, a slave who um, was picking, I would say, double the amount of cotton as the average person there. And she was doing it with two hands. And they say the way she did it was almost like an art form. And um, I was uh, talking to my mother in, in the past and then recently, because I remember she said as a little girl, she used to pick cotton. And I asked her, well, you know, how difficult is it to pick cotton with, with two hands? You know, and she made it, um, a comment that made it sound like it was um, very difficult. So for this person, and, and when you read the story about her, she kind of created a um, an art out of it that helped her to go from one place to another and, and sort of being, being free, or at least that's the uh, impression that I got from it. Um, another important part of the book was expansion and growth. Baptiste explains that the expansion of the United States into the Deep South during the 19th century was driven by a demand for cotton, which was the most significant global commodity at the time. The forced migration and reallocation of enslaved people to new territories were instrumental in increasing cotton production. Uh, another thing was torture and innovation. The book describes the torture practices, inoffensively termed the pushing system, which were used to increase productivity. Enslaved people were subjected to relentless pressure to pick more cotton. 
Baptiste argues uh, that these methods were a form of industrial innovation that enhanced efficiency, drawing a direct line between the violence of slavery and modern economic practices, which leads to another thing of uh, in economic impact. The profits from the slave labor did not just benefit the Southern economy. They were in, integral to the economic development of the entire nation. Northern banks and businesses financed and prof profited from the expansion of slavery. Baptist demonstrates that slavery was not an archaic system, but a dynamic and modern business model that fueled growth and the expansion of global capitalism. Uh, another area is moral and ethical implications. Uh, the book does challenge challenge readers, and uh, you know, like I said, the parts that I've read to confront the moral implications of how American wealth and economic power were built on, on the foundation of slavery. Um, he does uh, call for like a re-evaluation of the traditional narratives that have minimized the role of slavery in American history. I'm thinking back on when I was in grade school or high school and, and they discussed uh, slavery, it uh, was nothing like what I um, know now. Uh, the, the way it was sort of framed was like um, they, they uh, were fed well fed a lot, they, they received a, a, a exceedingly amount of healthy calories, and uh, they were able to develop strong bodies from their uh, hard work, which, um, you know, it's not, like I said, what, what I, I know now. Um, and now, in addition to the uh, Baptiste book, I, I believe the, the legacy of slavery and its impact can also be seen in another book uh, by Pamela Yatunde and Cheryl Gills, Gills. Black and Buddhist, what Buddhism can teach us about race, resilience, transformation, and freedom. Uh, I do encourage, uh, if anyone's interested, to, to to read these two books in terms of looking at the the impact and, and struggle for freedom, you know, regarding uh, the legacy of slavery. Uh, Gail Ferguson, her, her forward stated, the book is a practical message of cultivating inner spiritual power to meet the daily challenges of aggression, violence, lying, and deception. Uh, this book is a collection of writings from African-American teachers from all the major Buddhist traditions who tell their stories of how race and Buddhist practice have intersected in their lives. Uh, the, the writings do include racism, trauma, nobility, and the truth. And I'll speak on nobility uh, in, in a little bit. Uh, Yatundi and Gills discuss African-American anti-racism work. In their introduction, Yatunde and Gills wrote, African Americans are at perpetual risk of psychological imbalance and trauma due to the social realities of racism in the United States. Yatunde and Gills also discuss nobility from a Buddhist perspective. They state the formerly noble Buddha proclaimed that nobility is not about caste, but is about how one lives one's life to awaken from ignorance, hatred, and greed. This was a profound and radical reversal of perspective about fortune. Nobility in the Buddhist sense means releasing ourselves from the social constructs that bind us to the truth, positioning ourselves to receive the truth, accept the truth, and learn how to live equanimously with the truth. Moreover, there were and are countless attempts to permanently traumatize our historical and intergenerationally transmitted narratives. African-American nobility, as informed by a Buddhist perspective, means releasing ourselves from the racist social construct that blind us to the truth of our humanity, positioning ourselves to receive the truth of our humanity, accept our humanity, and learn to live equanimous with the truth of our humanity in a, social, in a society that still questions it. To be authentically African-American aligns well with the Buddhist nobility project. Nobility in the Buddhist sense is synonymous with right as it relates to the past. To be right is to be noble. And anti-racism activism is noble, right, and skillful when it comes to the effects of trauma. And as a psychotherapist, you know, trauma just bing, comes right to my head here. So I thought I'd write a little bit about that. Um, regarding trauma, you know, there's many definitions of trauma. Uh, but one that stands out, you know, comes from Dr. Bessel van der Kolk. You know, he writes how trauma is not just an event that took place sometime in the past. It's also the imprint left by that experience on mind, brain, and body. This imprint has ongoing consequences for how the human manages to survive. 
and your Tundi and Gills, right? You know, trauma can't be present. Trauma can be present in our day-to-day lives. The death of loved ones, job losses, divorces, and public disasters can all be experienced as traumatic. Trauma can also happen from an event in the past. Sexual abuses, illnesses, the losses of close relatives can contribute to the trauma-induced cognitive imprint that impairs our functioning. And as if our personal existence existences were not complicated enough as Black folks, we can tr- be traumatically affected by the experience of historical racism. And that leads me into chapter 20 of the Lotus Sutra. So here I'm going to discuss the story of the Bodhisattva never disparaging and reactions. Uh, Nawano stated in chapter 20, I should say that, that chapter 20 is different from the former chapters of the Lotus Sutra. The setting of the Bodhisattva never disparaging makes us think of like an ordinary city today. Right? The characters appear in the story of ordinary people that we can meet anywhere in this day and time. Kind of gives us a strong sense of humanity and, uh, and, of, and of things that are familiar to us. Um, and this is quite natural because, you know, it states vividly now by practicing only the one virtue of paying respect to others, an ordinary man realizes his faith and finally attains the perfection of his character. So while Shakyamuni Buddha was telling of his own past life, he wished to make people realize, again, three important teachings. The first is that to practice thoroughly even only a single kind of good deed is indeed sacred, and to do so is the first step towards salvation. The second is that however many formalities we may learn and practice, there is no essential worth in such learning or practice. The creation of a valid human life consists consists in our practice of even only a single kind of good deed with devotion and earnest perseverance. The third is that the Bodhisattva practice originates with revering others, that is, without recognizing the Buddha nature of all people. If we try to save others without recognizing their, their Buddha nature, We only perform empty and formal deeds. True salvation lies in our disposing of and respect for the Buddha nature innate in others. Now, there are some other important uh, teachings from the uh, chapter 20. And um, one of which is respect and uh, dignity and two, resilience and perseverance. Under respect and dignity, uh, disclosing and revering others' Buddha nature. Right? If one has the Buddha nature himself, others must have it too. If one can realize that his whole heart that has that that he has the Buddha nature, then he comes spontaneously to recognize that others equally possess it. Right? The Bodhisattva never disparaged and paid respect and commended everyone. You saw it saying, "I deeply revere you, because you are all to become Buddhas." Right. This deed of the Bodhisattva is the disclosing of and the paying respect to others' Buddha nature. His words, you are all to become Buddhas, indicate that he discovered others' Buddha nature, has paid respect to it, and has commended it. Regarding resilience and perseverance, uh, the next um, important teaching in the story of the Bodhisattva never disparaging is expressed in the following two sentences. Whenever he spoke thus, the people beat him with clubs, sticks, or stones. But while escaping to a distance, he cried aloud, I dare not slight you. You are all to become Buddhas. And we can learn two lessons from this short passage. The first is that never disparage and escape to a distance from his attackers when they use violence against him. When you think of like a willow branch, how the willow bends to the wind, but it's not broken, even though the tree might look fragile. Right? An oak branch, on the other hand, they break in the storm despite the tree's apparent sturdiness. You know, sometimes, uh, at least from my uh, background in law enforcement and martial arts, it's never to hit something head on, right? You always look to go to, down the path of least resistance. Um, Buddhism teaches the principle of flexibility of, of the mind and the life of the Bodhisattva never disparaging, illustrates the ideal person living this way. Another important point of the story of Never Disparaging is that although he escaped from physical persecution, the Bodhisattva held fast to his belief and never renounced the truth. This uh, is important when it comes to connecting uh, Juneteenth and uh, Chapter 20. So there's 
two parts uh, to connecting Juneteenth in chapter 20. Um, one is parallel themes and the other is liberation and enlightenment. So I have five points in drawing a parallel theme and discussing liberation and enlightenment. Uh, one, endurance in the face of adversity. Regarding African-Americans fight for freedom, enslaved African-Americans endured unimaginable hardships, including brutal physical labor, systemic oppression, and psychological trauma. Despite these conditions, they maintained their humanity, resisted their oppressors, and fought for their freedom. Key historical moments, such as the Civil Rights movies, Movement, exemplifies this resilience. Figures like Harriet Tubman, Frederick Douglass, and Martin Luther King Jr. symbolize the relentless pursuit of freedom and equality. Regarding the Bodhisattva never disparaging, the Bodhisattva never disparaging faced hostility and abuse from those he tried to honor and respect. Despite being reviled and attacked, he persisted in his practice of bowing to everyone he met and acknowledging their potential for Buddhahood. His perseverance is a testament to unwavering commitment in the face of adversity, rooted in profound faith and compassion. Two, commitment to a higher vision. Regarding African Americans' fight for freedom, the vision of a society where all individuals are free and equal drove the African American struggle. The Emancipation Proclamation, the ending of slavery, and the ongoing fight for civil rights were fueled by a deep seated belief in justice and human dignity. This commitment was not only to mediate freedom, but also to, broader, to the broader vision of an exclusive and equitable society. Regarding the Bodhisattva never disparaging, the Bodhisattva's actions were motivated by the vision of a universal enlightenment. He saw beyond people's present actions and behaviors to their inherent potential for enlightenment. The higher vision enabled him to endure suffering and maintain his practice of respect and compassion, believing that everyone could achieve the good of it. Three, transformation through suffering. Regarding African Americans' fight for freedom, the suffering endured by African Americans under slavery and segregation was a crucible that forged a strong, resilient community. This resilience led to cultural, spiritual, and social transformations that continue to influence American society today. The ability to transform suffering into strength, cultural expression, and social change is a significant aspect of the African-American experience. Regarding the Bodhisattva never disparaging, the Bodhisattva transformed the hostility and suffering he experienced into opportunities for compassion and teaching. His story illustrates that enduring suffering with patience and a compassionate heart can lead to profound spiritual transformation. This transformation is not just personal, but it also impacts those around them, untimely leading to their recognition of their own potential for enlightenment. Four, the recognition of inherent dignity and potential. Regarding an African American's fight for freedom, the fight the freedom was fundamentally and recognizing and affirming the inherent dignity and rights of African Americans. Despite being treated as property, African Americans asserted their humanity and potential. The resilience of African Americans was rooted in a deep belief in their own worth and the worth of their community. Regarding the Bodhisattva never disparaging, the Bodhisattva's practice was based on the recognition of the inherent dignity and potential for Buddhahood in every individual. He saw beyond their current actions to their ultimate potential. This recognition was the foundation of his unwavering respect and perseverance. And lastly, number five, legacy and hope and inspiration. Legacy of hope and inspiration. Regarding African Americans fight for freedom, the legacy of African American struggle for freedom continues to inspire movements for justice and equality worldwide. The resilience show serves as a powerful example of what can be achieved through persistent effort and unwavering belief in justice. Figures like Rosa Parks and contemporary activists continue to draw on this legacy to advocate for change. Regarding the Bodhisattva never disparaging, the Bodhisattva story serves as an enduring inspiration for the Buddhist practitioners. His example teaches the power of respect, compassion, and perseverance. This legacy encourages others to see the potential in every person and to persist in their spiritual practice despite challenges. And from here, we look at applying these lessons today. Um, one is self-respect and dignity. So one, I do uh, encourage the practice of self-respect. 
right? And recognizing uh, the, the dignity in oneself and others. And, you know, I think this can come in many forms and many ordinary uh, moments in our lives. You know, if it's if, if you're into drinking coffee, it could be at your local coffee shop that there may be an opportunity. You know, if you're getting gas, it could be if you, you know, drive a car and have a vehicle, then that could be an opportunity there. It's these little moments where I think, you know, people um, may not see the um, potential. And uh, but I will say in my experience, it, it exists everywhere and all the time. Uh, the second part is community support. Um, I do uh, I encourage us to continue supporting each other, you know, as we do here as a saga and whatever other communities that, that you guys belong to. Um, and um, if there's something you're interested in sooner than later, I do encourage the saga members here to attend the anti-racism forum of the Chatham Area Interfaith Council. Uh, they are presenting a two-hour program at the Chatham Synagogue. I believe the title is We Are Better Together. Um, I think that could be a start if that's something that you're interested in. That was my conclusion and reflection. Um, any questions or, or answers? Questions and answers. Any questions or comments? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let me stop sharing here. Hold on. There we go. Okay. Um, let me just uh, really quickly add on to what uh, Newman was mentioning, and just to give you the details, tomorrow night on the 20th at 7 p.m., there's going to be a uh, Better Together Loving Conversation About Race. It's a two-hour program being held at the Chatham Synagogue, it's part of the Interfaith um, Council of the Chatham area. So I highly recommend people to attend that. This particular gathering is for the various congregations that belong to the Interfaith um, Council in uh, Columbia County. Uh, we've been working on this for a while. The, the um, Anti-Racism Forum has been meeting for about five years and we've begun taking the show on the road, so to speak, with some public forums, but we're keeping it. Um, we're concerned about people's reactions to dealing with race. Specifically, we have to have sheriff department there. This is 2024, and when we're dealing with race in the United States, it's necessary to have security on the premises. There's something wrong with that picture. However, it's a very important uh, program, so I would just like to push it again tomorrow night, 7 p.m., Chatham um, Synagogue. If there's anybody who needs details about how to get there or whatever, let me know and I'll be happy to share with you. Uh, the other thing I was going to mention, um, and, and thank you very much, Yuman, for giving that a plug. Um, the other thing that I was going to mention is that what we, what Yuman did not speak about um, was the period of time after Juneteenth when from the late 1860s into 1870s, Jim Crow law was established and made systemic racism the law of the land around the United States. And so while African Americans are still dealing with the legacy of slavery, that legacy has been put into law by the Jim Crow laws that were established from that time that were not uh, relieved until uh, the mid-1960s with the Civil Rights um, laws passage. And of course we still know that segregation and uh, discrimination are still rampant. Just to give you a very brief statistic of how that works from a systemic perspective, Albany, well, New York, a population of approximately 100,000 people, has the third lowest home ownership by African Americans in the country. That's not Mississippi or Alabama, that's in the north. 
And so the effects of racism are still present and the way it raises its head is often not recognized because how many people would have known that statistically even be possible. And by the way, Albany has a um, people of color population of 40%. So the difference in the number of people who own homes there who are black is not because of a lack of black population in that city. So just to bring that, just to add on to what to what Yumon was was speaking about, what we're really dealing with right now is not how people feel about race. Everyone says, oh, I'm not a racist. It's about what do we do about systemic racism, racism that's built in to the very laws of our country. And so I just wanted to add that to that. And I think you did a great job, Yumon, in connecting it with uh, the Lotus Sutra and with Buddhism as a whole. So why don't I open it up to questions in general? And uh, I'm just going to go ahead and stop the recording for the questions.